Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of After the Cuts, The Future of History in Canada, a roundtable at the 2013 National Council on Public History Conference in Ottawa. Panelists are Ellen Judd, President of the Canadian Anthropological Association, Laurel MacDonald, President of the Association of Canadian Archivists, William Ross, President of the Canadian Archaeological Association, and Lyle Dick, President of the Canadian Historical Association. Martin Leberge served as moderator. All opinions expressed are of the individual speakers and not necessarily of their affiliated associations. You can find recordings of other talks and roundtables at activehistory.ca. A few comments on uh, today's uh, roundtable. Uh, as you know, um, the roundtable today wishes to propose a reflection on the multiple cuts imposed lately in Canada on government funding uh, of public history. And in a way, um, our meeting today can offer some form of transversal assessment of what has often seemed to be specific and precisely targeted uh, cuts in the orientation of uh, public funding of public history. Um, I will present you the, today's speaker, and after their presentation, we will open the floor for discussion. So uh, today we'll have uh, Lyle Dick, uh, President of the Canadian Historical Association, Ellen Judd, uh, President of the Canadian Anthropological Society, uh, Laurel McDonnell, President of the Association of Canadian Archivists, and uh, Bill Ross, President of the Canadian Archaeological Association. And myself will I'll be uh, uh, watching precisely the time uh, each of you are allowed. Uh, Martin Laberge, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Quebec uh, uh, on Outaouais, just on the other side of the river. So many thanks. So, Thank you, Martin, and thanks everybody for coming. This is a terrific turnout. I want to thank uh, James Opp for proposing this panel and facilitating its inclusion <laughs> in, the, in the NCPH uh, program, the program committee for approving it, and my fe fellow uh, panelists for participating. Let me begin by saying that the fact that this panel had to be staged re reflects a problem in communications that has emerged in the last decade, namely the official spinning of information about federal government decisions affecting culture and heritage. In a liberal democracy, citizens have a right to expect full and transparent communications regarding their government's plans and actions, but unfortunately this has not transpired. I hope our panel will enhance awareness of the scope of cuts or reconfigurations of federal heritage programs, facilitate greater cooperation and advocacy amongst our professional organizations, and encourage greater involvement of public historians in these important issues. Since the Massey Commission issued its reports more than 60 years ago, the federal government has been a key patron of Canadian culture and heritage, and Canadians have recognized the need for governmental support so that its cultural institutions might thrive. Without significant support, there would be very, very little Canadian publishing, broadcasting, pop popular music, scientific research, visual art, museums, and historic sites developments. Our attachment to the nation state rests less on strident patriotism than on a continuing relationship to our national institutions, including cultural programs central to Canadian identity. Federal departments and agencies devoted to culture and heritage were hit hard by the 2012 uh, budgetary reductions. Two prominent examples were the budgets of Parks Canada, reduced by 29 million, and Library and Archives Canada, reduced by 19 million, compounding years of reductions. An analysis by Globe and Mail reporters a couple of weeks ago of federal spending plans uh, over the next two years reveals this may be only the beginning. Uh, projected cuts of 15% between 2013-14 and 2015-16, uh, 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 spending at Parks Canada will be reduced by a further 13.57%, and Canadian Heritage by an additional 17.47%. For culture and heritage, this means that federal fiscal policies are likely to pose even greater challenges than they already have. 
As Canada's leading association of professional historians, the Canadian Historical Association has sought to document the cuts and changes to mandate to position our community to challenge and seek to mitigate these impacts. Uh, the federal agency with which we have been most engaged is Library and Archives Canada. Laurel McDonald will be addressing the LAC issues in detail, so I won't elaborate them here. I will simply state that the CHA has met often with LAC executives uh, on numerous occasions over the last several years at which we have expressed concerns uh, of the historical community regarding archival practice, acquisitions, conservation services, and uh, these discussions are ongoing. I want to briefly touch on the recently announced change in mandate and prospective revamping of exhibits at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, to be called the Canadian History of, Museum of History, albeit that Ellen Judd uh, will be discussing CMC in greater detail. The CHA did not join in the early criticism based on the inference that the new museum would be crafted as a political instrument of the current government. Instead, we tried to assemble the facts and express our concerns directly to museum executives. Regrettably, our letters and expressions of concern have gone unanswered, largely. It seems that CMC is not interested in serious engagement with the professional historical community, yet such involvement is essential to the credibility of the revamping exercise and to prevent the appearance of politicization of a national museum devoted to Canadian history. Further, the ad hoc public meetings convened over the fall and winter do not constitute true consultation in our estimation. The CHA will continue to press the museum to engage the professional historical community and to provide answers to our questions. In light of its unresponsiveness, we would appreciate feedback from this gathering as we position ourselves to move forward. I will focus the majority of my remarks today on Parks Canada, the federal agency I know best, um, as the other panelists are addressing the other programs. Parks Canada was one of the agencies most affected by the 2012 cuts. By way of background, it is the federal agency responsible for Canada's national parks, national historic sites, and marine conservation areas programs. It has a very important mandate to protect and present outstanding places of our natural and cultural environment for the benefit of Canadians and future generations. Since 1919, more than 1,000 National Historic Sites have been designated under the National Commemoration Program, and Parks Canada directly administers about 158 of these, about one-sixth. As a result of the 2012 budget, 31 sites, or about 20% of the sites directly managed by the agency, have been destaffed and their doors effectively closed to the public. Fulfilling the agency's mandate for all its programs requires research, consultation, and assessment by professional historians and archaeologists, and uh, in some cases ethnographers. Uh, the cuts resulted in major reductions in program services and uh, professional staff in history, archaeology, curatorial, and other functions across the country. The destaffing of the 31 sites represents a diminishment of the NHS program and affects national historic sites in every region of Canada. However, the impacts are not distributed equally. For example, in Saskatchewan, the Motherwell Homestead National Historic Site, one of four operating national historic sites in that province, has been destaffed, representing a 25% loss to the NHS program and uh, the end of federal presence over southeastern Saskatchewan, uh, a vast land area. Uh, that poses, I asked the uh, former D Director General or Vice President West of Park Santa why these sites were selected for destaffing, and he told me it was largely uh, on the basis of low visitation levels. And if that is the case, that poses a problem for National Historic Sites in Canada's regions, which cannot draw on the large population pool of Central Canada for their visitation. So uh, the concern is that are we setting up uh, again, a regional imbalance in program. And with the end of staffed operations at these 31 sites, the demand for research on the cultural resources uh, or stories of these sites, of course, has also been diminished. Uh, since the establishment of the agency in 2000, most of the financial resources available for research on sites or in the field have been concentrated in the field units that is in the regions, uh, but their budgets were also uh, 
significantly reduced in 2012. So their capacity to fund the research has also been significantly reduced. In terms of the cuts on scholarly research in Canadian society generally, uh, this is accelerating a long process of attrition of professional historians at Parks Canada and almost certainly will diminish the net contributions of Parks Canada to scholarly publication. This is particularly the case in the regions uh, which were hard hit by the recent cuts. Uh, do, they, um, do the cuts, cuts affect the practice of history and related disciplines equally across the country? Uh, no, there seem to be some inequities there as well. Uh, most, in fact all but one of the historians and archaeologists in the Quebec office uh, were de-staffed. Um, there were more history possessions retained than archaeological, but there seems to be, uh, again, uh, some regional imbalances. The last question uh, that has been posed to us, how can our respective disciplines optimally position ourselves to move forward in light of these cuts to history and heritage? The current context is a very challenging one for history and will remain so for some time. We are in a new era in which at least one of the major federal parties, the one in power, seems highly skeptical of many government services, especially in the area of, of culture and heritage. Uh, and also skeptical of the role of professionals in the natural and human sciences and uh, the humanities. Universities have fared somewhat better than federal government departments, but it's, it continues to be an uphill battle to convince decision makers of the importance of continued investment in research capacity and professional development for agencies uh, directly under federal management. National associations in the humanities and social sciences will need to press for maintenance of funding levels for history-related programs while reminding decision makers of the cuts that have already been sustained. We also need to do what we can to generate awareness of the critical role played by these programs in Canadian society. In the current climate of retrenchment, we need to make particular efforts to be broadly visible. We need to keep building constituencies and alliances to keep our associations and voices united and strong. Given the unreliability of official government communications, associations of public historians will also need to develop the capacity to research and independently establish the actual impacts of federal budgetary decisions. It's too large a task for any one of us to undertake in isolation. Greater collaboration and information sharing between and among our respective societies and others will be critical to documenting and understanding changes to government programs and to optimizing advocacy efforts on behalf of our members. While strongly advocating for the continuance or strengthening of programs uh, supporting the scholarly practice of history and other disciplines, we need to be prepared for any and all eventualities, including the possibility of further reductions, as I mentioned. In this kind of context, uh, it may be in the interest of long-term survival, it may be necessary for organizations to take a hard look at uh, their service offer and above all ensure their self-sufficiency. Perhaps uh, membership fees will have to be raised in some cases. We need to make sure we're afloat regardless of what funding regimes are in place. This panel represents a very good beginning in cooperation between our respective societies. Our challenge will be to keep this conversation going and to develop new strategies to work together to better engage the public and the politicians. Part of that challenge will be learning to better connect with and manage media. A further challenge will be navigating advocacy efforts through the government's close monitoring of charitable organizations. Seizing any opportunities to deliver core messages to like-minded organizations, decision makers and the general public will be key to our future success and health. The continued involvement of public historians in national, historical and related organizations is essential to this task. The recent revival of the Public History Group as a vital affiliated community of the Canadian Historical Association speaks well of the potential for public history concerns to be core to our association's activities. The National Council on Public History continues to be a vital partner, but we also believe that a greater number of public historians within the CHA would surely enhance our efforts and reach. At the CHA, we want to encourage all public historians in Canada to consider joining or rejoining our association. By working together, we can best ensure that our voices are being heard on these matters of critical importance to public historians and Canada's historical community, and indeed the country. Thanks.
I would like to thank the Canadian Historical Association, Lyle and Martin, and the National Council of Public History for extending this invitation to anthropology. We face shared issues at the moment, and it's time to join together in addressing them. I would begin by raising a key question. Is the Government of Canada giving up on civilization? This question is, of course, occasioned by the changes looming for the Canadian Museum of Civilization. We have all had the privilege of appreciating this national monument to the cultural heritage and the living present of all who have peopled this land, most notably the First Nations, Inuit and Métis, as curated, researched and shared publicly by expert and dedicated scholars for more than a century. This history can be traced to the founding of the Anthropological Division of the Geological Survey of Canada in 1910, one of the earliest and the uniquely national and public incubator of professional anthropology in Canada. It was distinguished by its expertise <coughs> in multiple facets of anthropological research with the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, in particular material culture and languages, and by its early practices of engagement and of public anthropology. In these early years and later as the National Museum of Canada and the National Museum of Man, the curatorial and research work extended to include attention to Canadian settler cultures, notably in rural Quebec, and beyond it to our connections with the larger human experience, although the focus and collections have remained predominantly focused on Canadian Aboriginal peoples. As established in 1990 and still in effect today, the vision of the then renamed Canadian Museum of Civilization has been expressed in the following mandate of the Museums Act. The purpose of the Canadian Museum of Civilization is to increase throughout Canada and internationally interest in, knowledge and critical understanding of, and appreciation and respect for human cultural achievements and human behavior by establishing, maintaining, and developing for research and posterity a collection of objects of historical or cultural interest with special but not exclusive reference to Canada. And in this process, the museum is empowered to undertake and sponsor any research, including fundamental or basic research and theoretical and applied research related to its purpose and to museology and communicate the results of that research. The Canadian Museum of Civilization has on this basis been <coughs> dedicated to publicly supported scholarship on core issues in the Canadian and the human experience and is internationally renowned for its work. Upon a substantive research basis, public exhibitions have been rigorously created to be offered, critiqued, and constantly renewed as a trust to the Canadian people. Exhibitions have not been simple presentations of artifacts, but products of research increasingly curated in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples. This work has been largely but not exclusively anthropological and has depended on the sustained and sometimes lifelong work of specialist curators in ethnology, cultural studies, archaeology, and history. Regarding the more contemporary <coughs> anthropological research I've been asked to address today, the Division of Ethnology, focusing on Canadian Aboriginal peoples, and cultural studies, also largely anthropological and addressing both Aboriginal and settler societies, has until recently had 12 curators, eight in ethnology <coughs> and four in cultural <coughs> studies. As of today, Four ethnology curators with established expertise in the anthropology of Canadian Aboriginal peoples have recently resigned or retired without being replaced by equivalent professional staff in continuing positions. This is a process that has been unfolding for a number of years and has also included the loss without regular replacement of the anthropologist who served as director of the Division of Ethnology and Cultural Studies until 2009 the same year the museum lost its curator of Asian Canadian peoples and terminated that position. The expertise among the remaining curators with research responsibilities is less anthropologically specialized and includes only two ethnologists of Aboriginal Canada and two specialists in Aboriginal art. In May 2012, the Canadian Museum of Civilization administrative structure was readjusted to no longer include a vice president for research and collections. Research and collections are now placed under a former vice president, now director general of exhibitions and programs. <laughs> and the two research divisions fall under a director of research recently transferred in from a comparable position in the War Museum. The current executive of the museum includes no member with research or collections expertise. It is unclear what the future of research will be at the museum despite the substantive need for research both in itself and as the basis for exhibitions and programs of quality. 
In the autumn of 2012, a further indication appeared with the first reading of the Canadian Museum of History Bill, C-49, which provides a new and reduced purpose. The purpose of the Canadian Museum of History is to enhance Canadians' knowledge, understanding, and appreciation of events, experiences, people, and objects that reflect and have shaped Canada's history and identity, and also to enhance their awareness of world history and cultures. It also has a narrower empowerment to quote, undertake or, and the, the, this is original emphasis, undertake or sponsor any research related to its purpose or to museology and communicate the results of that research. This language of undertake or sponsor any research renders even research within the reduced mandate optional. It would be possible under this language for there to be no research undertaken within the museum itself. And it appears planned that research may become an adjunct to exhibitions once they are decided rather than the informed and critical basis from which they arise. A reorganization of research within the museum has been in progress for the past year, was due to be announced last month, then this week, and is now deferred for at least another month. Some of the consequences are already clear. The First People's Hall, a signature creation of the Canadian Museum of Civilization, is 10 years old. It cannot maintain or renew itself, and it requires continuing research and collaboration to ensure that it is current with contemporary Aboriginal life and engages with emerging issues and multilogs regarding the past and present of Canada's First Peoples. There is a substantial and living heritage gifted to all of us by the First Nations Inuit Métis and a legacy of curating this gift that is a public trust. In his response to my earlier letter to the Prime Minister, copied to the President of the Canadian Museum of Civilization, Dr. Mark O'Neill replied that the First Peoples Hall will continue to highlight the remarkable story of Canada's First Peoples and the wealth of their modern day contributions. Who will do this? The anticipated new exhibition on Canadian history will, according to Dr. O'Neill's letter, include aspects of the Aboriginal experience, but shift towards other still unspecified Canadian historical themes. Here a very considerable amount of research and enhancement of collections will be required. The museum's collections are currently, depending on definition, 70% to 80% Aboriginal, as this has been the established curatorial expertise of the museum. Elements of material culture cannot be simply borrowed from other collections and placed on display. There are major issues of cost, access, time, research, and vision. As indicated in the public announcement in October 2012, there will be a one-time only provision of $25 million for the transformation of the museum. But this will not be new money. Rather, it will be reallocated funds that will come from other sources within Heritage Canada. Perhaps from Libraries and Archives Canada. Um, these funds are designated for a renovation of half of the museum's 100,000 square feet, given current costs to meet curatorial standards at this level of roughly $1,000 per square foot. This generates concerns about underfunding by as much as half, or $25 million. Conceivably, this shortfall could be reduced somewhat by use of elements already within the museum's holdings, but there is knowledgeable concern in the field that the undertaking is severely underfunded with anticipated consequences both for funding elsewhere in the museum and for the quality of the new exhibition. Normally, it takes from four to five years for a project with an established research area and with the resources already in curatorial hands to proceed through the process of development and collaboration that results in an exhibition. As the project has a fixed opening date of July 1st, 2017, and is still largely in its early stages of conceptualization, there's cause for trepidation. As a specialist colleague has advised, be very afraid. This plan is due to culminate at the time of the 150th anniversary of Confederation and presents a view of Canadian history as settler history. In the words of Museum President Mark O'Neill to be found in the museum's website, and I would ask you here to listen both to the words and to the words that are not there in this passage. Canada's history, from the fur trade to the Northwest Rebellion to Confederation, through two world wars and the Quiet Revolution, to Canada in the world, will come to life. Authentic and artifact rich, the Canadian Museum of History will bring individuals into direct contact with the touchstones of our history. Champlain's Astrolabe, The Last Spike, historical portraits, artifacts of our nation's founders, relics of our national sports and athletic accomplishments. 
This follows a paragraph that indicates the retention of the Grand Hall in the First People's Hall, but the frame has decisively shifted. The frame now, wholly conscious or not, is the imported imaginary of the modern European nation state and its transplantation to new territory. This history enshrines a much diminished vision compared with the collaborative one that recognizes our shared occupancy of these lands and the fundamental character of all Canadians as treaty people. Canada's history truly began long before there was any thought of Canada, and we all benefit from the living legacy of the First Nations Inuit and Métis, fashioning vibrant societies and cultures and maintaining relationships with neighbours. Those who arrived later, both the French and the British, whose languages and cultures have contributed distinctively and indelibly to the Canada we now know, and successive waves of newer arrivals from all corners of the world have brought with them an abundance of linkages with larger and now global realities. The Canadian experience has never been limited in time and space and is intrinsically part of the larger human experience. <coughs> we inhabit a world of connections among Indigenous peoples worldwide, intrepid voyagers and settlers, and a citizenry deeply connected with the globe in which we are articulated through ties of kinship and relatedness and through predominantly peaceful bonds of caring and shared experience both here and abroad. We are unavoidably and willingly engaged with the human experience through links that form a vital part of our past, present and future. A national museum dedicated to the people of Canada must necessarily include Canadians from every corner of the world and recognize the unbounded mosaic of Canadian life. I too look forward to 2017 and to the moments of gratitude and inspiration the year will offer. Aware of great good fortune in being Canadian, and also aware that not all my fellow citizens are fully shared in what Canada has to offer. As I reflect on our cherished milestones of Confederation itself, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the courage of national apology and of truth and reconciliation, I see a history of expanding inclusion and respect. Ultimately, this comes from our shared values and principles. But making these effective has required knowledge of our social world built on honest and rigorous inquiry <coughs> and its considered application in concert. For this, we have needed to nurture, support and protect those who serve our national purpose through the common pursuit of knowledge and through sharing knowledge widely as the project of an informed citizenry enabled through our public institutions. Let us make the future Canadian Museum of History one that honours our home and native land. Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, also thank the committees for inviting the uh, Canadian Archaeological Association to be here. I think this is a really, really important meeting. Um, uh, I would also point out this paper has been put together by the, our public advocacy committee, uh, not by myself, so I can share the blame if people disagree. <laughs> a brief comment on terminology is in order. Uh, our definition, that is the Canadian Archaeological Association, of history includes the entire archaeological record. Canadian history and heritage then includes the entire record of human development, beginning with the first evidence of First Nations some 13,000 years ago to the present. The vast majority of Canadian heritage, from a temporal perspective, lies in the pre-European sites recovered from the soils and waters of Canada that is recovered archaeologically and is non-renewable. The cuts to Parks Canada have certainly produced devastating impacts on this archaeological on this ancient record. And I, I should point out that I was asked mostly to speak about Parks Canada, so that's the, the, the gist of my, my talk. We must uh, briefly discuss the magnitude of the cuts. The handful of remaining people within the organization have little or no opportunity to fulfill their previous mandate to monitor, protect, and interpret the heritage within Canada's federal parks, historic sites, and other federal lands in general. The cuts have not been a mere reduction but a sheer gutting and destruction of the ability to fulfill any responsibility to the heritage record and to Canadians at large, as 80% of their research and curatorial staff positions were deleted, now leaving eight full-time archaeologists to be responsible for the entire 40,440,681 hectares of federal lands, of which 90% fall under the control of Parks Canada. There's some controversy over the exact number of archaeologists, but as you know, it's hard to get exact information from this government. <laughs> the movement of all collections, documentation, and reports to Gatineau 
uh, which is also in the plans, clearly indicates the remaining staff is not to do any work on looking after these resources, and if they are called upon to recover some endangered resources, they are not in a position to adequately identify and analyze them, as they will have no comparative materials or literature or experienced staff. The capacity for research and professional practices has been severely compromised. The laying off of almost all Parks Canada research interpretive staff and collections management staff, which Environment Minister Peter Kent is quoted as referring to as insignificant backroom staff, eliminates centuries, if not millennia, of accumulated knowledge, prevents the ability to monitor and rescue heritage materials from various destructive forces, such as erosion and construction, uh, leaving them to be destroyed, and eliminates knowledgeable staff for interpretation and education. The proposed movement of all collections, field, and laboratory notes and documentation and reports from the regional offices is what we believe to what we believe will be understaffed warehouses in Gatineau will eliminate access to these materials. Some of the regional offices are being closed, and there are no available materials for Parks Canada staff in the remaining offices to, ex to adequately record and recover future materials because of the lack of comparative and type collections. Also, it is significant that arche archaeological collections are not considered part of archaeology in Parks Canada. They are in a separate collections division, which explains why management sees no problem in leaving archaeologists in the regions, but moving all their collections to the Gatineau. The research materials are essentially unavailable for research and interpretation to any researchers except a handful who are familiar with specific collections. There are no local resources for regional staff or collections to be available to respond to public requests and educators. We believe even those who have access to the Gatineau collections will be facing limited access to huge, poorly staffed warehouses. Uh, remember the last scene in the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, where a forklift deposits the crate in an endless room of containers? <laughs> That's what we're looking at, we think. Almost all the staff who are familiar with the collections, recovery, and information on the collections have been laid off, so their knowledge and expertise is no longer available. Each region has its own customized database program. They're incompatible, so the digital databases will not be integrated until conversion programs or a new program is developed at a cost budgeted at around a million dollars, and that's probably an under underestimate of some magnitude. Large numbers of our artifacts are in danger of being left unrepaired or undergoing gradual destruction, therefore becoming unavailable for research since the vast majority of conservation staff are being eliminated once the collections have been moved. These vast quantities of important and exciting heritage information are essentially lost to research and educational development until such time as Press Canada is revived in some format. There appears to be a determination to support a return to a certain politicized perspective of history focusing on the military and politicians, hence the support for the War of 1812. This will force researchers to focus on these areas if they want to receive federal funding. There may well be reduced support for pre-European research and publications. Uh, the idiosyncratic, excuse me, I didn't get into 1.30 last night, so, <laughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I apologize. The idiosyncratic attitude of the government to archaeology is evident in the fact that the underwater archaeology unit of Parks Canada has remained intact, while every other aspect has been gutted. There are as many or more underwater archaeologists as terrestrial ones, again, depending on whose numbers you believe, despite the vast different number of sites to manage. This suits the Conservative Party's view of history, especially when it's related to neat things, uh, for example, the Franklin vessels and its obsession with photo ops in the Arctic. Although, as a colleague told me recently, the two Franklin vessels are the only two National Historic Sites that we don't know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> we have reduced our ability to deal with known sites while continuing to spend an inordinate amount of money looking for something difficult to locate, and a limited research value is found. It's difficult to justify this as a cost-saving effort. The broad impacts are dramatic reduction in the recovery and interpretation of all Canadian history, but particularly the pre-European portion. Reduction in awareness and interest in Canadian history by Canadians and visitors, visitors causing the public to turn to American history or much of the drivel on TV. Reduction in funding for research, interpretation, and publication of history. Presentations at federal sites reduced in quality and quantity. Uh, live animated performances are replaced by static signage and fact sheets. And reduction in tourism and that economic fallout as a result of less interesting site interpretation and parts experiences. Given the reliance and justification of actions based on number of people, there's a danger of future closings of federal heritage sites and parks in response to reduced public visitation of these facilities 
because there's going to be nothing to see. There is certainly the strong likelihood of dramatic losses in the fragile and vulnerable history or heritage resources buried in the ground. There will be a reliance on past levels of interpretations. Knowledge that does not grow and develop slides backwards. The very loss of our Canadian identity is at stake. Uh, this issue is sufficiently serious that Susan Legault, uh, the Federal Information Commissioner, has recently agreed to review on how government communication rules impact information accessibility. The loss of archaeology in the federal government contributes further to the loss of Canadian comprehension of the complexity of First Nations cultures. It's an impact on how we view the relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians, an increasingly important issue for this country's future. The present government's attitude is summed up by the entry in the study guide for new immigrants. Pre-contact Aboriginal history is dismissed in one paragraph, and I quote, Native peoples lived off the land, some by hunting and gathering, others by raising crops. The Huron Wendat of the Great Lakes region, like the Iroquois, were farmers and hunters. The Cree and Dene of the Northwest were hunters and gatherers. The Sioux were nomadic following the bison buffalo herds. The Inuit lived off Arctic wildlife. West Coast natives preserved fish by drying and smoking. I think the fish. Uh, war <laughs> warfare was common among Aboriginal groups as they competed for land, resources, and prestige. Um, that's a quote from the guide. Uh, what about the incredible diversity of languages, dynamic, ch di dynamic changes through time, or anything about the Arctic peoples? The cuts affect all areas dramatically. There will be somewhat greater impacts in areas such as the West Coast Maritimes, where regional offices are closed or greatly reduced, and no or few archaeological staff to be a voice or presence. Quebec will suffer more than some areas because they have more staff and more programs to cut. The cuts are so severe that the impacts are overwhelmingly everywhere. Financial implications will be exasperated by the burgeoning costs of consolidating the records and collections into a central large facility, including packing, shipping, closing existing facilities, and developing an adequate new one. While we don't have a figure of the cost estimates, it's clearly going to consume a large part of the Parks Canada budget. The move of the Atlantic Regional Lab across the harbor to a new facility gave some indications of how expensive and complicated such a process would be. Uh, Quebec region's inability to develop a needed facility in a timely manner is further evidence of the difficulties they face. Again, it's hard to see this as a cost-saving venture. Members of all the heritage slash history and related disciplines must become activists to be certain that all Canadians know about these federal actions and their impact, impacts on the reduction and in many cases, the annihilation of our heritage. The current government focus on, focuses on winning elections. Uh, all disciplines must work to convince the public that they must let the government parties know that their interest in preserving and develop our heritage must be addressed or there will be repercussions at the polling booths. There needs to be a strategy where all media are used to develop awareness and express concerns. Committees need to organize in every province and territory to make certain that all Canadians understand the nature of these cuts and to encourage them to be vocal about their unhappiness. These, excuse me, these committees need to draw on members from all affected groups and associations to become involved. Every opportunity must be made to remind the public of every possible occasion of these negative impacts through the written media and online communications such as Facebook. For example, during the recent budget presentation, Flattery's announcement stated that we do not need to slash and burn. The statement would, should, have had, should have been responded to with numerous declarations across the country that there are major ongoing cuts and their ongoing impacts, so they do continue to slash and burn. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me um, here this afternoon to speak about the effect of the federal cuts on the Canadian archival system. Um, if anything, I actually find it heartening that <laughs> archivists actually aren't alone, if there's something to come out of this. So on April 30th, 2012, Library Archives Canada, without any consultation with the archival community, announced that it was eliminating immediately funding for the National Archival Development Program. Um, the elimination of this successful program will certainly have dire consequences for the Canadian archival system and also for small and medium archives who heavily relied on this very successful granting system. 
In order to understand the true impact or the true effect of the elimination of these grants, one really has to understand the unique nature of the Canadian archival system um, and how it interacts. So in Canada, the Canadian archival system um, makes us unique around the world. Um, the Canadian archival system is an interlocking network of public federal bodies and associations, of uh, provincial and territorial councils, and of the um, small and medium archives that they actually represent. And the premise of the Canadian archival system is that the preservation of Canada's documentary heritage is fundamentally a shared responsibility. And so in order to coordinate all of this, in 1985, the Canadian Council of Archives was established. Um, it came out of the Wilson Report, um, as well as federal and provincial governmental bodies' endeavors to provide some sort of coordination um, across Canada with regards to pre the preservation of our documentary heritage. Um, the Canadian Council of Archives um, is pr predominantly responsible for coordinating um, the archival system um, and also for promoting and developing a national archival network. And the CCA um, actually identifies on an annual basis priorities for, for preservation of our documentary heritage. Now the council themselves are a fairly independent body. They consist of a board, but they also consist of representatives from all of the provincial and territorial archival associations, as well as from the national um, professional associations as well. So l'Association des Archivistes de Québec, um, and the Association of Canadian Archivists are also, um, also are, are part of the CCA. Also very importantly, Library Archives Canada, and in particular the Librarian and Archivist of Canada, um, also has a role um, on the CCA. Now Library Archives Canada's role within the Canadian archival system is so key and so fundamental that the 2004 Library and Archives Canada Act actually um, establishes this role. And it states that LAC's obligation is to support the development of the library and archival communities, and that the role of the Librarian and Archivist of Canada is to provide professional, technical, and financial support to those involved in the preservation and promotion of the documentary heritage and in providing access to it as well. So LAC is, is key um, to um, the Canadian archival system. And towards this end, uh, Library Archives Canada has actually provided funding through the National Archival Development Program. The NADP was established in 1986, and the CCA's primary role was actually to administer um, this granting program. The program itself is a 1.7 million uh, matching grant program. It's fairly small and fairly e economical, um, but over the past 26 years it's done wonderful things. For example, um, it was involved in the development of a national online catalog of archival descriptions um, and descriptions um, for provincial and territorial counterparts. So it enabled all archives, including the very small across Canada, to make their archival descriptions available online and to reach out to Canadians. It also created programs in all of the provinces um, in which you actually had dedicated archives advisors and conservators that actually provided free archival and preservation advice um, to archives around the country. And many small and medium-sized archives um, and heritage groups actually took advantage um, of, of these important roles. Um, the program was also responsible at the provincial level and territorial level for providing site assessments to individuals who are interested in creating archives and it provided it to both rural and urban archives in order to um, ensure the safeguarding of Canada's documentary heritage. Um, from an archival professional perspective, uh, the NADP also provided monies uh, for backlog grants, usually under which um, young archival professionals um, had the opportunity to arrange and describe um, archival records that normally wouldn't be accessible because of backlog and staffing issues. And in fact, many archivists who are in this room, um, including the Provincial Archivist of Manitoba, our first archival job was actually fulfilling NADP grants, um, which not only provided um, us young archivists experience in arrangement and description, but more importantly, it also made these um, archival materials available to the public for posterity. 
And finally, the program also sponsored outreach and educational activities in various um, communities um, to ensure that small institutions could manage their, their records appropriately. So, for example, the Archives Association of Ontario um, had a very extensive uh, professional development program in which um, regular workshops on um, archives fundamentals and on preservation and conservation um, were all offered. And this all came through the CCA, through the NADP program. And this program um, has been lauded by federal auditors. In fact, it's actually been deemed a model of um, distributed grant programs. So um, this program has been lauded as being successful, economical, um, and so you can imagine to our surprise um, when the program was actually eliminated without any consultation. And to give you a general idea, these are some of the um, projects that the program actually sponsored um, in its last two years, in 2009 and 2010. And for example, you can see that 71 um, institutions in 2009-2010 were actually directly supported or had projects with this program. Um, archives and advisors and conservators in 2011 um, answered over 5,500 um, questions concerning um, um, archival issues. So you can see it was um, a wonderful joint effort of coordination and, and ensuring that um, all of Canada's archives, and particularly the smaller archives, um, actually could have um, expert advice and expertise and the resources available to ensure that the documentary heritage in their holdings um, were accessible to the public. So it came to us as a surprise um, on April 30th, uh, 2010, which I think go now goes down in archival mythology as uh, Black Monday, um, when Library Archives Canada announced without any consultation um, that effective May 1st, 2012, they were actually eliminating the NADP. And the short-term consequences of this was that 90 projects that had actually been approved by the CCA were immediately cancelled, and this affected um, 73 archival organizations, and undoubtedly what this meant was that archival material was either lost or was not going to be described. It also meant that the services of 11 archives advisors and conservators throughout Canada um, were actually significantly uh, reduced and that their advice um, was limited and in some instances no longer available um, to smaller archival institutions. It also meant that the operations of 11 of the 13 territorial and provincial councils and associations um, were significantly reduced as well. So it had a tremendous immediate impact um, on the Canadian archival system. The long-term impact um, in light of not having this uh, program in place means that um, smaller organizations, the mom pa archives, um, smaller heritage organizations that have relied heavily on the NADP will not be able to make archival material um, available to the public or to appropriately preserve um, Canada's documentary heritage. So it does have a, a tremendous impact on, on um, all archives, but in particular smaller archives throughout Canada. Another huge impact of this, um, undoubtedly, is that um, the future of the Canadian Council of Archives, um, and as a result, the Canadian archival system is incredibly unclear um, and uncertain. And this is um, actually a photograph um, from May 28th of last year when archivists, um, to protest the cuts, actually uh, had a funeral uh, for the death of archives and the death of history um, outside of Wellington Street. Now to add to this situation, um, in February, um, Library Archives Canada New Code of Conduct was actually made publicly available. And it was disconcerting to the Canadian archival community because section 4.42 of the LAC Code of Conduct identifies things such as teaching, speaking at conferences, and other personal um, engagements as quote unquote high risk. Um, and, and LAC staff has traditionally been um, leaders in the Canadian archival community. Um, staff has served as editors of Archivaria, our learned journal. They've heard, they served as head as, of conference programs and committees. They've served on the ACA board. In fact, they helped to establish the ACA. So if anything, um, other than being high risk, um, these activities have done nothing for LAC other than bringing um, more prestige um, to archivists and to the institution itself. 
And of course, out of grim humor, um, some archivists now have established a Facebook page in which they actually, it's called High Risk Archivists. <laughs> and uh, we identify various high, act, high risk activities we've done throughout the day, such as talk to colleagues in other archival institutions, uh, remove staples from staple guns, and talk to genealogists. So. <laughs> So um, in typical Canadian fashion, um, at the end of February, two expert panels were established um, to look into um, library and archives and into Canada's documentary heritage as well. So um, at the end of February, the Canadian Council, the Council of Canadian Ac Academies um, announced that they were holding an expert panel on memory institutions in the digital revolution. And this panel is being chaired by, chaired by Dog Oram of UBC Okanagan. And this panel was actually commissioned by LAC um, to investigate um, the impact of um, the digital revolution on heritage in institutions. Um, this panel uh, basically um, is expected to report back uh, to LAC um, and to the broader community uh, in 24 months. At the exact same time, the Royal Society of Canada established an expert panel on the status and future of Canada's libraries and archives, and that's currently being chaired by Patricia Demare um, with the University of Alberta. Um, and that um, process will be a very consultative <coughs> process in which um, the panel will actually be consulting with individuals in the library and archival community, and they're expected to report back um, in the fall of 2014. Um, somebody was saying that the LA ACA should actually establish an expert panel on expert panels, but um, we did do something similar, but we did it earlier. Um, in, in June of 2012 at our AGM, the ACA board struck up our own uh, task force, and that's called CAST, and it's the Canadian Archival System Task Force. And it's being chaired by Scott Goodine, who's the Archivist of Manitoba. Um, and moving forward, that task force um, we'll probably have about a two-year mandate, um, and what we'll be doing is investigating or reframing or reimagining um, the Canadian archival system, because certainly the events of the last year um, have certainly, um, you know, shaken us to our core, um, and moving forward, um, clearly, um, this will give us the opportunity to reframe and, and rethink, rethink the Canadian archival system moving forward. So thank you. Thanks for all our panelists. You made my job quite easy, respecting time uh, quite surprisingly. Uh, so we'll now open uh, the floor for, uh, for a question. The question for the archivist and anyone else in this room that hasn't seen one of Library and Archives Canada's new information things, um, they've decided to start Mythbusters. Um, so please check out their website. There's, um, I guess, t nine myths that they're counteracting. The second one is which... Um, the changes being made at LAC make it harder for people to access the documentary heritage materials they need. They're denying this after cutting um, interlibrary loans and uh, other essential services. So is there any response from the National Association of Archivists? Um, I think in many, um, many respects it should probably be a response from the, CH, the CHA as well um, because certainly many of the myth-busting myths um, that are on the site actually directly affect and impact um, on the research community. Um, you know, the, the, cre the key concern over the last year with LAC... Um, the, the key issue over the last uh, year with regards to LAC is that there's actually been a lot of passion and myths actually on, on both sides of the issue. So for us, um, as an association to sort through it at times can be very problematic. Um, so if you do go to the ACA website and you look under our section on advocacy, you'll see that um, all of the issues that we've brought up with regards to LAC have been issues that actually directly affect um, the archival community and the archival profession itself. Um, I, I do have to tell you that um, for the past uh, couple of months, um, a reporter from a fairly prominent um, newspaper has been contacting me, trying to sort through um, all of the myths and determine what are what's factual and, and what's true and it's been it's been fairly problematic so that's my very long way of saying yes I've seen the Mythbusters page 
sorting through whether or not that truly is myth-busting or not um, is proving difficult. Um, but it's certainly some of the key points on that page might be something that um, the CHA or Lyle might wish to address, particularly those that actually affect um, the research community. Uh, thanks, Laurel. I was just advised about this Mythbusters uh, page actually uh, today at lunchtime. We do have, uh, we'll take a close look at it. We have had um, extensive meetings with LAC executives, Danielle Caron and Cecilia Muir, uh, who's second in command at LAC and a number of other uh, senior people there. And uh, certainly issues like the cutting of interlibrary loans and uh, other, you know, uh, obvious reductions in archival service across the country are of great concern to us, and we have had many discussions about those. But I won't comment on the MythBusters page until I've had a chance to look at it. But our archives chair and our executive will certainly look at it closely and uh, attempt to verify our our own uh, reading of the situation with regard to those points. I can't say much more than that at this point. Does that satisfy your yeah. concern? Yeah. I wonder if anyone on the panel can speak to the cuts to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the other major funding agency for historical scholarship in Canada. The major cut last year was not announced at the time of the budget. It was the cut to the aid to uh, uh, attendance uh, uh, scholarly associations, essentially the travel budget, uh, which subsidized in many cases the attendance of uh, graduate students and others uh, needing assistance to attend the Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences. And uh, our executive got on that and on their behalf I wrote to uh, the officers at Shirk to express our serious concern with that. That certainly affected our uh, finances at the CHA. Uh, because we had applied for and used uh, such grant monies to subsidize the attendance of the CHA conference uh, by graduate students, which is essential for us. We need the involvement of graduate students and younger emerging <coughs> historians. They're critical to our future membership, but not to mention they make important contributions to our annual uh, general meeting. Uh, also, we were in touch with ACUTE, the Association of Canadian University Teachers of English, their president Stephen Slemon wrote a very strong letter to Shirk to also express serious concern about that. And we also express uh, our support to the, I forget the name of it, but the National Graduate Students Association. Um, but um, I don't think that, I think the consensus is that program is unlikely to be revived. In the mean meantime, our treasurer, uh, James Opp, uh, came up with an imaginative solution to at least partially compensate for the losses by setting up a fund uh, funded by the CHA uh, to assist graduate students in attending. I mean, that's not obviously uh, uh, an adequate replacement, but it will certainly uh, be a significant support to uh, students. I don't see that program being um, reinstated in any way, but we are trying to be proactive in our communications to the Federation to ensure that the Federation understands that these programs are critical to the, uh, indeed, such programs as the Aid to Scholarly Publish Publishing Program. We absolutely need the maintenance of these programs because that's critical to the health and sustainability of our organization. <coughs> Does that answer your question, Sean? Great. Can I make the <coughs> We certainly have a, a wide range of concerns. Uh, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada has been just absolutely critical to supporting uh, the social sciences in Canada and, and very supportive. But there's a huge range of issues we um, are looking at and, and would wish to pursue further, so there certainly are reasons. I would just like to take very briefly mention one of these because it may be of interest to, to everybody here as, as a citizen. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, the government decided that this Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada would no longer fund health research. Um, I'm not sure how many people in the room are aware of this. Uh, basically, there was a, previously it was possible to have medical anthropology and other um, social research related to health funded both through SHRC and through CIHR. Now it is all supposed to go in the first instance to CIHR. It can be funded through SHRC if um, 
it's medical anthropology, but has no implications for anybody's health. <laughs> and you can read this, <laughs> and, and you can read this statement. So you know, so, something sort of very ancient in terms of, um, say, the origins of acupuncture or something of that sort could presumably still be researched. Uh, but if it has implications for people's health, it's supposed to go to CIHR. But CIHR is mostly concerned with um, delivery of clinical medicine and, and biomedical and epidemiological research, so it doesn't accommodate uh, social science research very well, and we've been lobbying very actively on that. The, the result basically is that whereas Canada previously had a very vigorous and well-funded medical anthropology, we've had the rug pulled out from under our capacity to research the social determinants of health. And I think that's something all Canadians care about very deeply. And while people are finding ways to lobby and rewrite their grant applications and um, find some ways to survive still in SHRC, I actually still hold a SHRC grant that has health implications, um, although it's not primarily what it is. And I'm not primarily a medical anthropologist. Uh, you know, people will still find ways to continue, but we have had a, a severe reduction in the capacity to do research on this how we would build a healthier society in a social science sense. Uh, I'm also glad to hear that someone else's student travel grants got cut. <laughs> uh, we had ours cut last year uh, for the Canadian Archaeological Association, and the same as Lyle, we're desperately trying to get students involved. Um, <clears throat> we have a limited travel budget that we use, and uh, knowing students, we have to go through very carefully and make sure that all six or eight who came in the van don't all claim Randall for the van, but uh, we were told basically that the program is cut and it was tough. It's not going to be reinstated. Uh, we're actually thinking of raising our annual fee by 10 bucks per member other than students, and that $10 would be, would be specifically put into a student travel budget because I don't think we're getting anything as a senior university. I would worry about other things too, but that's been the, the one major thing that we have found right off the bat. If it makes you feel better, Bill, it was it affected the ACA as well. Good, good, good. <laughs> um, luckily, though, we have the ACA Foundation, um, so that has actually been in in light of um, loss of shirt funding for travel to conferences. Um, the ACA ACAF Foundation has been able to uh, provide grants and monies to students to ensure that they actually come to our conference. So, so that uh, that's helped a bit. I wonder if uh, each of the panelists could uh, perhaps suggest whether or not um, there's been any attention paid or, or you're interested in paying attention to gender differentials in, in these impacts. I think, for example, of uh, changing the focus of the CMC um, to what is essentially uh, a militaristic and political um, history. If you do that, um, given the, given the uh, representation of women in, in both of those fields uh, in Canadian history, it seems to me you're, you're removing a whole uh, capacity for uh, understanding how gender has functioned, uh, even within the military and political uh, settings. And when it comes to collections and archives and uh, various other kinds of uh, research grants, given that there are always collections coming up and that similarly uh, there's underrepresentation in many cases uh, of women's and, and um, all kinds of different uh, sexual orientation uh, uh, populations, it seems to me that since this whole effort here is at some level going to have to connect with what politicians are interested in. 50% of the voters in this country are female. So I'll just toss that out. Those are very important points, and we have a great deal of trepidation that this is just what is going to occur. And um, probably we should be doing considerably more to address these issues. The point we're at is as far as I understand with the Canadian Museum of Civilization right now, is it's incredibly difficult to pin down exactly what they're doing. Um, and in, in the letter that I wrote in the fall, I got a response more or less telling me that all of the things I was worried about being cut and so on, well, I didn't really have to worry about it because it was all going to still be there. So basically, we're having trouble establishing a clear case for making exactly these, <laughs> these arguments. And by the time we can demonstrate it, it will have been done. 
So uh, we have a kind of strategic issue here, but I think everything you're worried about, I'm very worried about, and I'm particularly worried about uh, the integration with the War Museum, although that is not entirely new. That existed in 1990 as well. But there's a great increase in uh, a conception of Canada as being a country forged in war. And I suspect that's why we're spending so much money on the War of 1812, because we managed to achieve confederation without a war. <laughs> so there has to be some compensation for this. And you know, it's um, a, a very dis disturbing process in, in many ways. Uh, the direction from the museum does appear to be coming from places that, 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 that disturb us, and uh, we should be mobilizing more actively for it. Thank you for raising that. Uh, just to bring you slightly up to date on what the Canadian Historical Association has been doing, our executive um, uh, worked with me to craft a letter to Mark O'Neill, president of uh, the Canadian Museum of Civilization, which was sent on December 3rd, expressing our, among other concerns, our concerns about the direction of um, uh, the museum would be taking uh, with regard to historiographical issues, which would reflect, uh, we argued uh, strongly that it, uh, whatever their exhibits do, they should reflect uh, Canadian current Canadian historiography in all its diversity, gender, regional, sexual orientation, and so on. Uh, we followed up with a meeting with Mr. O'Neill and his executives, that is the CHA executives, uh, on December 17th. They suggested they hadn't received the letter. Well, we ensured that they were sent uh, uh, two or three more times. Uh, they, we asked that it be replied to in a fulsome way. And here we are towards the end of April. They still have not replied to our letter, despite several follow-up requests. And uh, it does give us great concern because uh, that is not consultation. That's being frozen out of uh, the process. We will be following up in the next few days relating to that. And I appreciate your drawing that to our concern. And I assure you that the concerns you expressed are very much at the heart of our concerns as well. Um, and from the archival side as well, I appreciate your point, which is an excellent point. Um, the CCA traditionally um, has actually prioritized uh, what project applications would actually receive CCA funding. And traditionally, um, the types of projects that have received um, CCA funding have been under documented um, groups. Um, whether it be minorities, um, and certainly the last few years a key focus has been on, on First Nations archives as well. Um, so certainly that has been a concern um, for the archival community um, with regards to documenting under do documented groups um, where, we'll, where we'll be moving forward without the CCA, we'll have to see. Um, I'm, I, I, something sort of related to this is I, I've been an archaeologist for probably longer than I want to announce publicly here. Um, and I know um, and have known for a number of years people at Parks Canada and the Canadian Museum of Civilization. And when you make inquiries or out through the back door, none of them will talk to you. Um, they're scared. Uh, there's a huge uh, fear of re repercussions. There's a huge fear of being quoted publicly. Uh, there's a, even a huge fear of, of of somebody saying, well, you know, from an underground source, I received the following information. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost to the point where it's silly. Uh, and yet that's quite pervasive, both through Parks Canada and through the Canadian Museum of Civilization. Um, they, <coughs> you know, it's, it's uh, I will talk to you if you use a, <coughs> a disposable cell phone at three o'clock in the morning from Tim Hortons. Um, there, there, there is an actual fear of being fired. And repercussions. I mean, it's, it's it's absolutely disgusting in this country. Did that answer the last person's concerns? Great. Uh, well, it's great to see uh, all these organizations working together. And I wonder if you've given thought to widening the circle further. Um, it seems fairly evident there is a, there's a larger attack on knowledge, right? Which goes beyond culture and historical understanding, and we. You know, we know the long list from the long-form census to the muzzling of scientists. And I just wonder strategically if uh, the various organizations here have thought about allying themselves or trying to uh, present to the public uh, something maybe 
more focused on this question of knowledge that may be easier uh, for people to understand and grasp onto than uh, these issues that are, of course, important to us, but maybe harder to sell. I don't know. I just wonder what you've thought about that. Can I just ask, with Ron's question, uh, and which publics, given that the theme of this conference is Know Your Publics, maybe we could also talk about which publics do we want to get that message out to and love? Like, who, who can we target that is going to help us, <coughs> given that we're all sort of professional the organizations? people are going to vote harder out of office. That's mm -hmm. the people we got to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only way it's going to be done. But the Canadian Historical Association, we can't... Uh, <coughs> We can't take a partisan approach or a political approach. We need to take an advocacy approach on behalf of the profession of history and our members in particular. And I'm sure what Ron says is true. This does relate to a, a wider problem relating to, well, we referred earlier to the difficulty of getting information even for uh, staging this panel. So uh, there is a problem of access to, and of course the Information Commissioner has now launched a probe into these concerns. Uh, we, the CHA will be certainly proposing to our, um, our, uh, uh, our companion organizations that we talk about these issues in the near future. Uh, that's obviously something for our agenda. So I would, I would say definitely I'm going to put that on the agenda because we're going to be talking over the, the next week as to how best to approach this. Anyway. This is a very good question, and I think that there are probably two publics we want to have in mind here. One of the things that we're doing is to try to strengthen um, public anthropology, which has always been a, a particular orientation of, of Canadian anthropology anyway. Uh, but we don't necessarily all know exactly what is happening, say, in the museum sector or in certain other specific areas. So we're working through using our conference and our, our other vehicles, websites, newsletters, and so on, uh, to mobilize more support and to make public statements in this area. Because if we can get our whole discipline <coughs> online, that will help. But I, I think that it's quite right that at the same time, while we have certain constraints as professional associations, we are all <coughs> citizens. And there are other kinds of things we can do, and ultimately, um, I think we all know what we have to do. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure what section of the public we should be talking to, but I know that I've had colleagues within our organization say, you know, we should be taking out a full page ad in the Global Mail, uh, expressing our concerns, and I point out to them that the Environmental Lakes area just outside of Kenora, which is world famous for environmental science research, did exactly that. I can think of at least two full page ads uh, signed by 150 well known Canadians, and as of the end of March, the Experimental Lakes area was closed. Uh, it costs approximately $2 million a year to run, and what most people don't know or have not been told is part of the agreement with the Ontario government when they took that over 40 years ago is that the federal government has to rehabilitate that area <laughs> at probably a cost of somewhere between 50 and $60 million which is another 25 years of research down the tubes. So I, so I, I mean, I don't know what you do, I, to be quite honest. I, I think um, uh, we have to be careful as associations in, in being political, but I think that individually we have to become very political. I, I, don't, I see no other answer, to be quite honest. Um, until this government is gone, I, I don't see a lot of refreshing hope in the future. Um, that said, though, too, I think that um, the events with regards to the LIC Code of Conduct actually captured a lot of the public's attention. Um, and it also, um, a lot of individuals um, are now seeing archivists being acquainted with what's going on with the scientists. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if the information commissioner actually investigates what the LAC code of conduct. So um, in a strange way, I think those types of stories are what actually really attracted um, journalists to the cause and also opened up a wider debate um, as to archivists' role as information professionals and, frankly, the current government's overall agenda with regards to keepers of information as well. Um, I do think that, certainly from an archival perspective, um, our issue has always been about the general public not quite understanding what archivists do. Um, my father even said I was an archaeologist, <laughs> and I think Pierre Natel at the Department of Heritage uh, or a Committee 
uh, actually, uh, or was it Andrew Cash, when discussing LAC Code of Conduct, not only wanted to invite um, librarians and archivists, but archaeologists as well, to talk about the Code of Conduct. So I think from the archival pr profession, um, we have to do a lot more with regards to outreach and educating the public as to the incredible value and significance of archives. I mean, the thing is, if it's like the air that we breathe, the water we drink when it's not there, that's when you notice, and that when it's when it's truly dire. So um, we have to work with allied professions, um, with genealogists as well, um, and we um, we have to start promoting um, and doing better outreach ourselves. Just a uh, couple of comments about the Museum of Civilization is that it's always been uh, accused of being politicized. For those of us that are old enough to remember, that when it was open, it was deemed that it was it had forgotten Canadian history and where was Canadian history. So, I mean, that's part of being the environment. The other thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is talking about Dean Oliver before he's had a chance to do the job. Dean is known as an outstanding scholar in his field, is an award winner, and he's taking over a very difficult position. But I'm just wondering if he was asked to be part of this panel today so he could talk about what his mandate will be for the museum, given the new mandate for the Canadian Museum. I'd be interested to know if he's had the opportunity to answer that before we have the Dean, you know, Pillar Dean. <laughs> well, I think what I would, how I would respond to that is Dean was not part of that meeting that our executive had with the executives of LAC. I think he was out of town or something like that. But we went directly to their executives, including Mr. O'Neill, and we had that discussion. There's been no follow-up, and they haven't responded to our letter. So I think CMC needs to step up to the plate and respond to that letter and, you know, give a, um, undertake the common courtesy of taking our concerns seriously. Otherwise, there's no mandate for us to engage CMC until they have addressed our basic concerns, which they have not done. I certainly didn't address any individuals at all. I did look at what <coughs> is currently available about the way in which the museum is being restructured, and I think that there are reasonable reasons for concern there. I have written to, to the museum and had a reply, which I wasn't particularly detailed. So we are, in fact, uh, trying to find out, and certainly we would hope that things would be better, but there's some red flags that we really need to pay attention to because otherwise it's going to be too late. So if you wish to interpret all of this as a dialogue that will prevent problems from happening, that's fine. I would like it to be that way. I must say I'm personally not particularly hopeful, but if it turns out that way, we're leaving the door open, I would say, for things to turn out somewhat better. And conceivably, if we mobilize, it will be somewhat better. But um, th there's considerable reason for trepidation as well. But theres I don't think there's anything that's been said here today that's unfair. It's all based on the evidence that we have available. Mm -hmm. And if CMC wants to put more evidence out there, they can do so. One of the things that I find that strange is that we are not, I think, enough addressing their own reasons for their own changes. Uh, mainly, they don't answer. That we write to them and they don't answer. Uh, but when they do answer, or when they present that to the public, it's to save money. So they say it's going to save money, and more, many of you have said it's not saving money, it's costing more. Or it's going to be more efficient. And again, you've shown a lot that these things were already very efficient. And then they see things are not changing, like they told you. They tell, oh, and when we met the museum I'm the, uh, from the CHA, they said, oh, no, no, it's all there. It's, no, it's not changing. You, 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 you're not reading us properly. It's, it's not all going to stay the same. Or it's not in our mandate. Like when we met the archives, they say, you know, interlibrary loan is not in our mandate. Uh, or their world of society approach, it's going to be better. We're going to have a better way now to select documents than before. But their rationale is very, very shallow, and they don't think they have to provide one, which is extraordinary. They really don't think. So when, when I speak to people who know nothing about this, they say, so why are they doing this? And I say, well, I don't know. They don't say why. They... And then they say, well, you're kidding. They must have a reason. And I say, well, I can't find the reason, really. And, and this is, I find that extraordinary, that they don't even think they have to provide a reason. And I, I think the many reasons they have when we criticize them, like on their world of society approach, you know, they have this new, beautiful model to rationally discriminate between documents we'll keep and we won't keep. So we make a thorough criticism of this because they write, you know, frankly, you know, 
unsubstantiated things, then we criticize them, and then they don't think that they have to answer our criticism. So they're utterly unaccountable. Uh, and we are supposed to be professionals and intellectuals who speak at that level. And at the level of principles, we they are unanswerable. They don't have principles, they don't have reasons, and they don't answer. They really rarely answer. When they have a few reasons and we address them, it just vanishes. I find that extraordinary. Um, Dominique, do you think it has to do with the deprofessionalization yes. and the bureaucratization? Um, the reality is, as many of you may have seen the new um, job descriptions or job postings for LAC in which one no longer has to have an archival or library degree um, to actually work there. We have time for one more question. The intellectuals are dangerous people. <laughs> <laughs> High risk. <laughs> <laughs> Small C. <laughs> well, I wish to thank you, everyone. Thank you for the member of this uh, roundtable. Thank you for turning out in such uh, great, great numbers. And uh, as you know, the discussion and the debate isn't finished with uh, the end of this uh, roundtable. So many thanks. <laughs> You've been listening to a recording of After the Cuts, The Future of History in Canada, a roundtable at the 2013 National Council on Public History Conference in Ottawa. The panelists were Ellen Judd, President of the Canadian Anthropological Association, Laurel MacDonald, President of the Association of Canadian Archivists, William Ross, President of the Canadian Archaeological Association, and Lyle Dick, President of the Canadian Historical Association. Martin Leberge served as moderator. All opinions expressed are of the individual speakers and not necessarily of their affiliated associations. You can find recordings of other talks and roundtables at activehistory.ca.